in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. Until her retirement, she was the Director of Research at Sick Kids Centre for Community Mental Health in Toronto. Most pertinent to today's presentation, she is a long-standing collaborator on the International Learning Through Play program and research. And I think you heard earlier that she has had a long interest in Watch, Wait and Wonder and was a co-founder of that. In addition to that, she's had lots of other involvements and uh, she's a very talented person. Alfredo Tinajero is a human development specialist living in Toronto, Canada. He holds a PhD in early human development, University of Toronto, and a master's degree in developmental psychology. His main professional interest is to, in, in initiatives to enhance the well-being and health development in young children and adolescents. He's an advocate of interdisciplinary work in early childhood sustainable development programs. Alfredo has worked as a consultant in several organizations, including UNICEF, UNESCO, Inter-American Development Bank, Brookings Institution, Christian Children's Fund, which is now Child Believe, Founders Network, and the Sick Kids Center for Community Mental Health. He also has several international publications, including an encyclopedia on child development, books, and scientific articles. He currently works as an independent consultant and is a university professor. Alfredo and Nancy, welcome. We're delighted to have you here, and I'll turn that over to uh, Alfredo. Your meet there, go. Thank you, Andy. Um, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, and we see the screen as well. Yeah. Well, thank you, Andy. Good, uh, good day, good afternoon, or night to to everyone. I don't know. It's uh, it's a, a very interesting how here we can be connected uh, at different times of the day. Uh, Dr. Cohen and our, I are very happy to participate in this conference. We would like to thank uh, Nosrat, the, the organizers, for the invitation to share with you our insights on the parenting programs and emotional self-regulation in the early years. Dr. Cohen had a had an issue yesterday or late yesterday with her in at her home, some water coming in. So she has been uh, difficulties. I don't know if she's here, but uh, she said that uh, we agreed I will give the presentation and she's going to jump in anytime. Well, uh, sorry, with two computers. Okay. So this is an article uh, that uh, Dr. Cohen, Salasia, I'm a tour one myself, published in 2015. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this article, the history it has. It's actually uh, on learning to play program on the focus group data that was collected for many, many years. When I joined the Sick Kids Center for Community Mental Health in 2008. Andrew was there, and she was there. Uh, we found folders and folders with the focus group data coming from around the world. And for us, this was like a gold mine because uh, this focus group data, we realized it, it told the story about uh, what was happening in communities in different parts of the world. So again, a gold mine of data, and we decided to start analyzing it, to put it together. But data coming from uh, at least 16 different countries. And the story goes that uh, we develop a methodology to process the focus group data, and this methodology is explained here with the results. This is a 2015 article. Uh, and so I will share with you a little bit about the, the methodology we use and the outcomes. So the 
data we analyzed in the previous article, it came from 11 different countries. And we asked three different questions to collect the data, the responses from the caregivers. So the, the first question was, we asked the caregivers at the end of the LPP program, what have you learned, which is related to knowledge? We asked the second question, what are you doing differently, which is related to practice? What are they doing different in terms of their caregiving? And the third question was, what changes have you seen in your, your child and your family, which is related to outcomes? For example, the child has, according to the caregivers, a better motricity or higher self-esteem now. So what we did is uh, we processed all this information, this data, and we did it uh, first by creating, creating like a template with the possible responses. And then we came up to these uh, three groups I am presenting here, knowledge, practice, and outcomes. And we continue, continue coding the data, and we created at the same time at, at categories and subcategories. I am not going to go into detail here about this. You know, this is a very little small graph, so don't, don't worry about reading it. But uh, the main point here is that we created groups, knowledge, practice, and behavior. We created many categories and many subcategories, and we were able to code to enter the data into these subcategories. So the main finding, the main finding of this study was that approximately 50% of the data were coded into subcategories related to social emotional development and contributing factors. That was very interesting. So caregivers, according to their responses, were very concerned and mentioned that after the, the, after the delivery of the program, after the pen session, they mentioned that, for example, I learned about the sense of self. I learned about the importance of attachment. But at the same time, they said, and we are doing something different. We are, for example, we have now a better interaction with the child and we are playing more. And uh, in terms of outcomes, my child is, uh, has a higher self-esteem right now. I feel better myself as a caregiver. You see, so we found that approximately 50% of the data were coded into social emotional domains. And uh, what we did with the data, we tried to return it to the, uh, to the local program so they can process, understand. And in this way, this is, uh, this I think it relates to what uh, Mary was uh, sharing in the last presentation is sharing the data, sharing the information and make it accessible to the local programs. This is what we did. And what the idea was to make the social emotional domain more visible, okay? Because uh, we lack, we lack uh, uh, standardized tools to measure child developing in, in, in low income countries. We lack that or uh, very expensive to use or not culturally adapted. So I think in this way, using qualitative data, we were able to make the social emotional domains more visible. Now, uh, now let me uh, say something about why, what are we going to cover with Dr. Cohen in this presentation. <clears throat> you see here the, that uh, this presentation is about emotional self-regulation in the early years, which you may wonder why self-regulation here? And the answer is for me that uh, Self-regulation offers the opportunity to link science and caregiver practices in a very practical way. So it's easy to understand the links of between self-regulation and caregiver practices. In uh, this presentation, the main question is, can the notions of self-regulation enrich the LTP program? So, can the notions of self-regulation can en enrich the LPP program? How can we use these notions of self-regulation 
to understand the interactions between such emotional interactions between the mother and the child. Sorry, I have a problem here. I have my little cat jumping over, so I have to put her aside. It's not okay. Sorry. So the the main question, as I was saying, uh, is. Uh, can the notions on self-regulation enrich the LTP program? And uh, another question is if uh, these notions highlight something we should be paying more attention to uh, within the frame of the uh, learning to play program or other programs. So uh, what is the story of self-regulation tell us here that can enrich what we are doing internationally? So let me start here. You may uh, be familiar with the term, what is self-regulation, but I am going to cover it a little bit. Self-regulation refers to the ability of the child to manage, manage energy levels, emotions, thoughts, behaviors in ways that produce positive results. Just I have to excuse me one second, okay? My apologies. My apologies with that. I have to put the kite aside. The only way to to continue. My my wife says that uh, she has a uh, special needs that I have to treat her according to special needs. So I was saying that uh, I'm going to start by defining a little bit self-regulation, which is the ability to manage energy levels, emotions, thoughts, and behaviors in ways that produce positive results, such as well-being, loving relationships, and learning. Let's say, let me give you some examples. A child who's able to share a toy with uh, his her peers. Okay, this is an example of self-regulation. A child can uh, delay gratification for a moment. For example, yes, I can wait for the ice cream or I can wait for something. Okay, that can wait a little bit. Okay, it, it's a that's a, that's a, something that can define uh, self-regulation. So to start uh, thinking about self-regulation, there is a key concept that affects the, its development and the actual use of self-regulation, which is stress. Self-regulation has to do with how we handle stress. Here we have the scene, so it's a, it's a good example of what a stressor can be. Uh, See, so self-regulation has to do with how we handle stress. Are there are many, many, many stresses in the world so that children suffer. So let's say, uh, think for a moment about uh, newborn babies, the stressors they suffer. So look, newborn babies have to be fed, change diapers, they have to be cleaned, they have to breathe, they are exposed to noises. And let's think about uh, premature babies, okay, here the situation they have, in this situation they have more stressors. They are uh, have been prematurely delivered. And uh, so the sensory system is not fully developed. So they are going to be more, more exposed to stressors and we should take that into consideration. So self-regulation has to do with how we handle stressors, what we do with them. Uh, and uh, so a definition I, I can give you is, is the capacity of the child uh, to bring the, uh, the arousal level to a normal baseline. For example, if a child is scared about something, 
self-regulation refers to the capacity to bring this uh, activation arousal of the central nervous system and these hormone levels to a basal level, normal level. So this is self-regulation. It has to do a lot with the central nervous system and with the hormone levels that become activated because of stressors. Here we have uh, different stressors that relate to little children. And uh, I'm going to uh, give you, to mention a little bit of some of them, uh, some biological, for example, um, in nature, which, uh, for example, sugar, sugar can affect self-regulation. The lack of sleep can affect self-regulation. Some uh, emotional stressors, such as uh, fear, fear to the unknown, in many times, what is below my bed? This is a typical question children ask. Uh, fear about punishment. Fear about organizing thoughts. If I am in school, I have to learn to read. Okay, so that can be very scary for children. Uh, stressors of organizing thoughts. What comes first? I don't understand you. And other uh, stressors coming from the environment, for example, bright lights, noises coming from the environment. Okay, so uh, stressors again are everywhere, and uh, little children children are very exposed to them. Uh, I gave a, a workshop not long ago. That was last month, actually, in Ecuador. And I asked uh, preschool teachers that participated in the workshop, okay, what were your stressors when you were little? And the, the answers, the least of their stressors was endless. So we all are exposed to these stressors. What we have to pay attention to is that uh, that experience, adverse experiences related to toxic stress can activate in, in, a, in an unhealthy way, can program in, in an unhealthy way the uh, stress response system. And uh, Lynn Jones, she knows this very well, what happens with children who were a situation of war, for example. So the, the uh, stress response system, the cortisol levels, and the adrenaline and other hormones are activated immediately and become like this response becomes that a program that is that is sustained across life, which is very dangerous and, and bad for physical and mental health across the lifespan. So what we have to do is uh, that's the main message for the uh, for the ECD workers, for example, or those working with children is try to reduce stressors as much as you can. Now, self-regulation and early human development. Uh, the start, this is a beautiful picture. You see the exchange between a, a, that and his uh, little baby. And you see how finally they look at each other's eyes. This is very powerful. Self-regulation starts in the early years. Uh, develops uh, sensitive periods in the early part of life and continue developing more or less uh, until the age of 10. We always can learn self-regulation later on, but this is a, this is a sensitive period, uh, the first years of life and up to 10 years. Now, to understand self-regulation, uh, it's uh, we can use this metaphor uh, of the three brains. And uh, believe me, this is very helpful to understand how self-regulation works. So we have, uh, according to this metaphor of the three brains, we have not one brain, but we have three. One, which is in blue, which is uh, corresponds to the neocortex. Uh, and it's uh, related to the capacity to think, to uh, plan, uh, to communicate through language, to reflect. So this is the neocortex. And keep in mind, please, that this area, the neocortex, uh, is still developing in the early years of life. It's very important to consider this, to take this into consideration. 
the the other uh, brain is the one in red, with, uh, which corresponds to the limbic system. Uh, the, here we have uh, uh, the amygdala. Here we have the hypothalamus. Uh, this is the home of the emotions. It's the home of attachment. It's the home of uh, the hormones that are released. It, it's the home of the central nervous system activation. So this is the red brain, the limbic system. And the third one is the reptilian brain, which is uh, responsible, responsible for breeding and for temperature control. So main message here is that self-regulation has to do between the coordination, between the balance between the blue brain and the red brain. We want both, both are needed. We need emotions, but we need also the capacity to think rationally. So this is like, if you want, like uh, hot water and cold water mixing, we want the red brain, limbic system, and we want the blue brain, the onocortic. We want them both. And emotions are very important. We are humans because of our emotions also. So what happens in situation of toxic stress, and uh, I feel funny talking about this uh, when uh, Dr. Lynn Jones is present, okay, she knows this very well, much better than me. Uh, in situation of toxic stress, what happens is that the brain, the red brain takes over. You see? The red brain takes over, and the uh, blue brain becomes like an expectator. So, it's, so the, 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 the main lesson here is that it's very difficult to talk rationally, to try to think, reflect with a child who is under a red brain mood. So we have to always take this in consideration. But in situation of toxic stress, what happens is that uh, the HPA pathway, which is the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, adrenal gland, axis and the amygdala, this is red brain, are activated and adrenaline and cortisol are released. So again, the, the concept of definition of self-regulation for a physiological view is, is uh, the capacity of the child, the self-capacity of to bring this down to a normal basal, basal level before the stress, stressors uh, affected the child. So uh, something else, I have a, a, a picture of, uh, of the vagus uh, nerve. Uh, children, just to make the point here that children described as difficult, tend to have a low vagal tone. And this is very important to take into consideration. Uh, because uh, in self-regulation, one of the first steps is to try try to see the behaviors uh, not as a result of that the child is difficult, but as a result of that there is a stressor happening and affecting the child. In this case, children mm -hmm. with a low vagal tone have the tendency, because they feel uncomfortable for many reasons, uh, they tend to be more difficult. But this is not entrenched into the child again. This is something related to a stressor they are having. Now, I'm going to talk about two terms. And here, I think I will connect uh, with Dr. Chapman, what she was talking about. This connects to watch, wait, and wonder. These, these are two beautiful, powerful concepts I will talk about. The first one is called uh, limbic resonance, which is like a Y5 between the caregiver and the child. And so it's a a connection, a wireless connection of the red brains of the caregiver and the child. This is beautiful, very powerful concept. Limbic resonance is an automatic synchronization between two brains. It's non-cognitive, it's purely red brain. The connection is established through the senses and the child scans the experiences offered by the environment. 
And can, let me give you uh, an example of this. This is a very personal example. Uh, when uh, when my child was my son was uh, six months old, we put to sleep him in a separate room, and uh, he used to wake up at one o'clock, three o'clock in the morning. Okay, he's scared naturally, but we have a way to communicate. I have to a way to tell him I am here from my own room, and he had a way to respond. I hear you that. Okay, and my emotions uh, feel that you are here with me. And this way was very simple. He woke up and from my bed, I used to just repeat like a, like a dove, like the sound of a dove in Ecuador is ooh, ooh, ooh. And this was something that he, he could repeat. He had the capacity verbally to say it. So he answered back from his room, Ooh, ooh, ooh. And we had a brief communication. This was so powerful. This is limbic resonance. It, it is a, it's non, non cognitive. It's a synchronization of two brains. It's the bread, the bread brains vibrating like, a, like a two violins vibrating together. The second concept I would like to introduce, again, this is very powerful, is this one on biobehavioral synchrony. And here the author is, uh, is wrote, uh, Dr. Ruth Feldman. She's a researcher from Israel. It's fantastic work she's doing. So she, uh, developed the concept by your behavioral synchrony. And what she found is the following. Again, this take attention because this is so powerful. In moments of affection and deep exchange, the adult and the baby come to synchronize their heart rhythms, hormone releases, oxytocin, and activation of brain patterns. Look at this, this is so powerful. So that means with the in this picture, when, when, when the mother is hugging the little baby, all this is happening. This is synchronicity. Oxytocin is, uh, is a hormone uh, related to uh, that favors attachment. So uh, pay attention to this. So the hormone release uh, during this, these moments of intimate contact is oxytocin, which is a hormone that allows the child to be relaxed and to enjoy and make this little moment longer with the mother. Okay, I am with you. Okay, I'm with your my dad. So oxytocin are released at the same levels, okay, like as in synchrony. Uh, and the same happens, as I said, with the heart rhythms, uh, the antivection of the brain patterns. So uh, we know that we have alpha, beta, uh, different waves, okay? The waves are synchronized, okay? Their thoughts are synchronized. A few more minutes, Alfredo. Yeah, uh, so uh, this uh, synchrony is defined by Dr. Feldman as a, die, as a dance, it, and she says it's another way to understand attachment. So this is oxytocin, plays a fundamental role in attachment formation and synchrony. Uh, buffers the activation of cortisol. And is related to another good hormone, the dopamine, which is related to happiness. And favors the immune system response, oxytocin. It, has, it helps to manage stress related to social interactions. Um, this is something that captures everything is said here, okay? Love is the link between the body and the mind. So according to Dr. Feldman, there are four key behaviors of the mother toward her baby uh, to favor this uh, synchronicity. Is the first one is look to the face, look to the eyes deeply, provide positive affection, vocalizing baby talking high frequency and skin 
to skin contact with affection. So through these uh, practices, mothers help uh, children to, to, to create synchronies and patterns of rhythms, temples, and dynamics. So the mother and the child, or the father and the child, dance together. So in uh, this last part, I was just trying to reflect on something. What is the use of all these? Remember the question, what can be the contribution of notions of self-regulation uh, to, to the learning to play? So I am going to ask just a couple of provocative questions to uh, not keep an answer myself, but to ask questions. So the learning to play program we know it's uh, it's very directed to love, affection, care, tender. The main reflection, the first reflection I have is that we need also the other side of the coin. Not just to look at these love, care, affection, but also to look at stressors. Uh, also to look at uh, situations where children are in difficulties, in problems, psychological, whatever, which comes from the, the work of Dr. Chapman and especially the Dr. Lynn Jones. Okay, we, we, learning to play has to be about both sides of the coin. My uh, questions to reflect are the following. With this, I finish. Should we, be, should we be paying more attention to stressors and the way to reduce them? Should we do more about promoting touching, talking softly, looking deeply into the eyes? Next question is, are premature babies and other children with special needs, needs being overlooked within the LPP groups? Uh, and this is very, very important because, uh, in in my opinion, uh, the premature babies, for example, they need uh, the, some very particular special stimulation, but to in order not to overload them, they need skin contact. They need something else, uh, and uh, perhaps the LTP program can be enriched and and be first be aware that these children have special needs, for premature babies especially. And the final question is this, how can we support biobehavioral synchrony in mothers suffering from postpartum depression? So, uh, Dandy, I don't know if we have more time, but uh, I, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Coyne if she has something to say or... We are, we're running quite a bit late here. Uh, but thank you very much for your uh, presentation. There are some things in the um, chat box which you, during the break, if you want to take a look at those and try to respond to those. Um, I'm glad that Nancy could join us uh, for part of the conference and delighted to have you both here. So we'll, what we'll need to do now is take a break for about five minutes. Uh, when we come back, we're going to, we will go into the breakout uh, groups and um, so we want you to be here back in five minutes and then you'll choose the group that you go into. Uh, there's three different groups. Um, the the I'm one is- Sorry to interrupt, but isn't my talk prior to the breakout groups? Say, say it again. I, I thought the breakout groups followed my talk, our talk. Um, yes, we're gonna have a break now. I'm so, sorry, that's right. Yeah, we're gonna have a break now and then um, and then uh, Lynn and Asmamu are going to uh, do a presentation and then we go into the, the uh, breakout groups. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much, Lynn. Sorry about that. So uh, take five minutes, come back and, um, and we'll have another presentation and then go into the breakout groups. Okay, thank you. We'll keep, we'll keep things open, uh, but we will take